Glad to see all of you here, and remember to put uh, the 29th on your calendar. Glad your calendars work. Uh, I'm Ben Hill. I'm with uh, Georgia Tech's Venture Lab, and I'd like to welcome you to today's Georgia Tech Clean Energy Speaker Series. I'd like to uh, make just a few, a few remarks, uh, kind of thanks, and kind of a framework for today's program, and then turn it over to uh, Don uh, McConnell, who will introduce our speakers and then we'll get into the program. First, uh, let me just say, uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, the law firm Sutherland, Asbill, and Brennan, uh, McKinsey and Company, Strategic Energy Institute, Georgia Tech, Georgia Tech's Venture Lab, the Enterprise Innovation Institute, the ATDC Venture Lab, and i also like to thank South Face for their sponsorship of the program. And uh, on the way out, you'll find on the table some information about the upcoming Green Prince Conference, which uh, South Bay sponsors annually. The program will be March the 7th and 8th, Wednesday and Thursday, over the GTRI Conference uh, Center. So be sure to pick up uh, one of those brochures. Uh, today's presentation and previous presentations will be on uh, the website for the program, secleanenergy.gotech.edu. And today's presentation will probably be archived and available in a couple of days. Microphones will be passed around during the uh, Q&A period. And uh, for those of you here in the audience, be sure to get a microphone and speak into the microphone since this is being webcast. And for those of you who are participating over the webcast, if you have questions, you can send those questions to, email those questions to me at ben.hill at gotech.edu. That's ben.hill at g-a-t-e-c-h dot e-d-u. And as a uh, friendly reminder, if you have comments rather than questions, uh, I would ask that, uh, that you keep them brief and to the point. So um, be sure also to mark your calendar for the next program, which will be March the 28th. And the topic, which is very salient to this discussion on economic development and the role of clean energy, is building your clean tech company in the South, March the 28th. Don McConnell, who's the senior advisor to Georgia Tech and GTRI, on its energy research portfolio, and who's the president of the Tarrington Group and former president of Battelle Tell Energy, will uh, help frame our conversation for today and also introduce our speakers. So, Don? Thank you, Ben. Well, we've got an interesting uh, intersection of topics today. And that is, is that uh, in continuing with the discussion of clean energy and particularly how it applies here in the southeast, we're going to look at that intersection today with a very specific set of missions that are also well represented in the southeast, and that's national defense. Uh, if you think about it, uh, war fighting takes a tremendous amount of energy. Uh, DOE is one of the, DOD is one of the largest consumers of energy in the U.S. economy. But we're also living in a very interesting time uh, in the life of the Department of Defense. Simultaneously, we're dealing with the introduction of clean energy resources and executive mandates to accomplish that. We're also dealing with uh, reductions in carbon footprints and energy efficiency, and particularly now, increasingly starting to deal with the issue of the cost of maintaining and operating military facilities. Energy being a substantial aspect of many of those, depending on the service and its mode of operation. All of these don't necessarily uh, resolve to a single vector easily. They, can, they have different objectives, different directions, and so consequently the solution set is being pulled in a number of different directions simultaneously as we go through um, all of these being incorporated into base operations. And we're sitting right at the beginning of what is likely to be the next BRAC process in terms of consolidation of uh, military facilities in the United States as time goes on. So in an effort to try and bound this problem and give you a sense of what's happening and who's doing it, we've selected three different perspectives today. 
One from the viewpoint of a service overall, and in particular the Air Force's approach to maintaining its facilities and dealing with these energy issues. The second is, uh, and that will give us a sense of what the broad issues are across the whole spectrum of operations. In the second instance, we're going to talk about the particularization of solutions, in this case at Fort Bragg in North Carolina. And thirdly, we'll get a perspective from uh, a different side of the coin, which is basically the uh, industry's response to the military's requirements. And between those three, I think you'll see a number of different dimensions that come forward on. We're very fortunate to have the speakers to my left today. And in particular, uh, the first speaker I'm going to introduce uh, is Colonel uh, David Reynolds. He's a tech alumni, amongst other distinctions. And interestingly enough, his, his function here is commander of the Air Force Civil Engineering Support Agency that's located at Tyndall Air Force Base. And it is the field operating agency that supports 60,000 Air Force civil engineers. Civil engineers are those Air Force uh, officers and organizations that are responsible for the operation of the facilities and bases that the Air Force occupies. And that covers all of the commands and that uh, the Air Force supports, from combat command to materials on down. So as a consequence, uh, Colonel Reynolds brings the perspective that crosses all of the missions of the Air Force as it relates to this question of uh, particularly facility operations, even though the largest energy use in the Air Force is still flying airplanes in the process. So we'll get, uh, without further ado, I'll introduce him. He is a uh, 1983 graduate of AFROTC here at Georgia Tech and holds a master's degree and is a professional engineer. Colonel. All right, good afternoon. Uh, thank you to uh, Mr. Hill, Mr. Nation for help setting this up and inviting the Air Force Civil Engineering community to come participate in the series. On behalf of my boss, uh, Major General Tim Byers, who's the Air Force Civil Engineer, it's, it's a, a pleasure to be here today and talk to you about the Air Force program. Um, and I think you'll see a, a great connection as we move into the Army program and specifically what the Army is doing at, at one very large installation. Uh, you'll see the challenges are, are very similar. And as I talk to uh, folks across industry, um, the challenges uh, do mesh very well. So first, let me say, as an alumnus, uh, it is great to be back at Georgia Tech. Uh, the last time I stood behind a tech podium was very quickly to pass by and pick up a diploma. Um, and there were many folks who uh, probably never dreamed, especially in my fraternity house right around the corner on Fifth Street, never dreamed that this guy would be standing in front of a, such an august group. And uh, so I'm very honored. So thank you. I'm going to give you a, just a quick run through today. And what I'm going to try to do is, is shape my presentation uh, really today from the, the very large. I'm going to start with setting the stage, introducing uh, some of the strategic and tactical drivers that affect the uh, Department of Defense, the military uh, departments. And then I'll take this down a little bit further in discussing some of the programs and then close it up with a little bit of discussion on renewable energy. Mr. McCullough mentioned uh, the Air Force and fuels and energy. And this chart depicts the overall energy use by the Air Force and our costs. And this is also talking about the flying mission. You can see aviation makes up about 86% of the fuel use and energy use for the United States Air Force. Air Force is the largest energy user in the Department of Defense. Makes sense considering the number of aircraft we've got in the missions. Um, but also the largest user of energy in the uh, United States. So you can see aviation's huge. Uh, we have a secretariat organization. Dr. Kevin Geis is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Installations for Energy. His portfolio includes that whole pie there, aviation facilities, vehicles, and equipment. I'm lucky, and along with my boss, that we get to concentrate more on that facility, that 11% piece. But even as we break down that 11%, it, it's still uh, some astronomical numbers. About a billion dollars a year in energy costs for our facilities. And you can see how it's broken out there between uh, uh, actual BTUs used and then actual dollars. Uh, electricity, you know, no surprise probably to most of you in the room that electricity is a, a large uh, item for our consumption um, and it makes up the majority of our bills. So a big concentration in the Air Force and in the other services on how to reduce our energy demand, how to reduce our electrical bills. 
You know, we see natural gas as a huge opportunity. You know, we're tying in and looking for better ways to use natural gas in our community. You can see it's 32% of our use right now, but the bill, the, the portion of the bill is much smaller. So a lot of opportunity out there for us in the natural gas field that we're really just beginning to explore. So very much open to ideas and suggestions if anybody wants to catch me afterwards. To help kind of set the stage and give you an idea of the, the portfolio we're talking about, this is uh, my boss's uh, physical plant profile. General Byers is the civil engineer responsible for this physical plant. Tried to relate this to the southeast a little bit in Georgia. Um, large our homeowner. Um, acreage is huge. Uh, square yards of uh, asphalt and pavement uh, immense. Um, but facilities is really where our, our, our big energy use is down there. We look for uh, benchmarking opportunities all the time. We've been on what we call a core of discovery or voyage of discovery, out talking to industry, visiting different uh, industry leaders, IBM, uh, Exxon Mobil. How do they manage their facilities? And we find bits and pieces that we can pull and we can learn from, but frankly, nobody has quite the scope of facilities that we have. And so while we can learn a lot of great things from those industry folks out there, we still find ourselves in the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force a little bit unique and we do share a lot of uh, discussions between the three services. We also compete with each other quite a bit as well, um, but we do, there's a lot of collaboration that goes on between the services. Moving in, just to give you a picture, if, if you're not familiar with the military, I've, I'm an Air Force brat. I've been around the Air Force all my life. My dad was an Air Force civil engineer, um, finished up his career down in Warner Robins at Robins Air Force Base and I was a Warner Robins High School demon. Was lucky enough to be down there yesterday for an energy symposium and then come right on up the road here. Um, it, but this is kind of a typical of the Air Force bases that I grew up on over the years and we still have. Most Air Force installations are similar to a small city. You have all those challenges of a small city, uh, roads, building, personnel. Um, you've got multiple operational missions and it varies by base, which is just like different cities associate themselves with different industries. And then frequently, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, we're out there in less populated areas most of the time, not all the time. Uh, we tend to draw populations to us over time, encroachment we call it. Uh, and we always have to be on the lookout for that in terms of our flying mission. And I only mention that because it also comes into a factor when we start looking at renewables. Where can we put windmills? Where can we put solar so we don't impact our flying missions or our radar cross sections? And then finally, we uh, economics come into play. We are tied in with the local utility companies pretty much wherever we are. I think we've had one or two Air Force bases over the years that have been islands of power, uh, still some out in very remote locations of Alaska. But in most cases, we've, uh, we're tied in to local utilities. So what drives us to become more energy efficient? Besides economics, which we'll talk about, there's a lot of legislation out there and executive orders. And there's these three big goals out there, the big three that drive us on energy, water, and renewable energy. I'll just let you take a look there for a second. But you can see we're driving 3% uh, energy reduction per year, water, and temperature, uh, water intensity 2% per year, and then goals to increase our renewable energy. And it all ties in with the Air Force Facility Energy Strategy, in which we're trying to reduce energy demand, increase energy supply with renewables, and then modify our culture through training programs, just basically through a... Uh, taking care of uh, or taking advantage of technology and then training our employees how that technology can help them reduce energy. And it may be as simple as light motion sensors in facilities uh, to help turn off the air conditioning, uh, management control systems on HVAC systems. You know, it's pretty simple, but we don't have that across the portfolio uh, to manage our energy use. So we want to continue to drive that cultural change as well. Um, a lot of this comes down to making smart investments. Bottom line for us, it's economically driven. Uh, we've got to save dollars on our investments. You know, we're not out there investing in programs uh, for altruistic reasons. We're trying to look for dollars to, to save the tax, looking for investments to save the taxpayers' dollars. Uh, we make investments through a variety of funding sources. We use our operations and maintenance funding sources. Uh, we centrally manage energy programs out of my organization, the Civil Engineering Support Agency and our Air Force Facility Energy Center, which is a part of the agency, centrally manage energy programs and energy products. Um, uh, kind of a non-capitalistic model in that we control the money that goes out to the basis for the projects. We do about $250 million a year that we spread across about 86 installations. 
Uh, we don't peanut butter spread it. It's based on savings to investment ratios, BTU to investment ratios. Uh, we've got an additional program with the military construction program, which is larger dollar value projects. Uh, short name for that is MILCON, and then specifically ESIF, Energy Conservation Investment Program. At another 35 to 50 million dollars that the Air Force has access to. And we're, you're not, we're not unique in this nature. The Army and the Navy have similar programs, uh, managed a little bit differently, but they all have similar programs. Ours, we tend to be a little more centralized, I think, than the Army or the Navy at this point in time. Um, and then the last thing is that looking for third party funding. You know, everybody wants to use somebody else's money, and we're no different. Um, if we can use somebody else's money to reach our goals, to lower our bills, and if the third party can make a dime on it, that's even better because that's good for them and that's the reason why they would even come to us in the first place. So we're looking at that, especially in our renewable energy world, and I'll talk about that a little bit more as we get into supplies. But bottom line here, again, it's reduce demand, increase supply, and change the culture for the Air Force. Capital investment, I mentioned, save dollars, uh, meet those mandates that were on the previous slide. Um, again, savings to investment ratio, BTU to investment ratio. And again, I mentioned it's not a peanut butter spread of money. Um, that's a little bit of a rub for our installations because we're competing our installations against each other. I see a smile over here. We're competing our installations against each other to some extent in the development of projects. Um, so each base is out there. They know these goals. They're trying to meet goals. They're trying to develop projects. The reality is they all can't meet those goals. There are some who are, are better situated to meet some goals than the other. Uh, for instance, if, if you're uh, in an area that has very cheap electrical power, it's going to be hard for you to compete in the renewable energy business for solar and wind. You know, we've seen, you'll see some slides in a few minutes where the preponderance of our uh, renewable energy is the southwest. Not all of it, but the preponderance of it. Because um, economically it makes sense out there. The incentives have been in place to make it work out there. We closely track our projects uh, all the way through execution. We're looking to monitor to make sure we're getting payback for our dollars invested um, and so we can meet those mandates as we talked about, especially on the electrical side for the energy for the 3% reduction per year. Just to give you a, a flavor for the types of projects that we're seeing, and I, I can't say for certain that the Army and the Navy are the same, but I would bet they are. Um, you're going to see that the bulk of our project investment goes into uh, mechanical and HVAC and lighting and electrical work. That's where the bulk of our energy use comes in. And you can see there's a smattering of other areas there. Recommissioning uh, is a growing area for us, seeing uh, more and more of an effort to uh, recommission facilities. Uh, when some of the folks in the southeast have talked to me at some of the bases and said, what can I do if I can't do renewables? How can I compete in this energy reduction game? Recommission, maintain your facilities. You know, we, we underestimate how under-maintained our facilities are at times. Uh, we, we all believe we have good programs for operations and maintenance and recurring work programs for our facilities. But the fact is, when I send teams from Tyndall out around the Air Force to look at bases, they can always come back with the example of the damper that was wired open or the damper that was wired shut on an emergency call, and it gets forgot somewhere along the way, and they never go back and make the actual correction. Uh, or the construction project that just nobody caught that a particular duct to a critical room may not have been properly connected. So there's plenty of examples out there still of low-hanging fruit. We're not through with that. Um, and we've got to work all of that low-hanging fruit and then the more expensive solutions together. Another driver for us on the energy side of the house for the military is energy security. And uh, when we talk energy security, we're talking a reliable supply of energy. And it could, uh, when we're worried about security, we're worried about for many variety of reasons. It could be a hurricane down on the Gulf and what's going to happen at Tyndall Air Force Base if we lose power for a day or two or three. Yeah, if we lose power for a day or two, we're probably okay. If it's three to five, maybe the jets have to fly away and go do their training somewhere else. But we've got other missions for command and control that can't pick up and move. And we need to be uh, cognizant of what those threats are out there, whether they're natural disasters or man-made uh, creations or, or just you know, a simple error that happens sometime out there in the, in the maintenance world uh, that knocks out a substation and trips a large section of the grid. Uh, we've got to be prepared for that. Part of that is emergency generators. That's what we've relied on since the Cold War. But that's not the ultimate solution to our, our energy security needs. And so we're looking at potential for renewable type uh, sources of power 
and I'll move in a second to, uh, to microgrids and smart grids. Bottom line again, it's got to be economical for us. We can invest in some reasons for purely mission reasons and what may not be an economical project because the mission is so critical we have to support that mission at all costs. And I can think of some command and control type missions around the U.S. that would specifically would fall in that arena. I mentioned smart grid as we start looking at energy security. Smart grid uh, is definitely something the Air Force and all the services are looking at. Uh, uh, Secretary of Defense, OSD, and the Joint Community are looking at this. And we're looking for the best ways to do this. Um, can we do it for an entire installation? Do we need to narrow this down just to specific pieces of an installation? Or maybe just to a couple of buildings? We've had microgrids on our bases for years. We've always had the ability to segregate portions of our grid, hook generators up to those facilities. In some cases, that's all we need for a few days or a few hours. Um, but we're also looking at this bigger picture now, and is there a way to, to tie this smart grid technology in with renewables? Um, one of our challenges as well with smart grids is you want to be able to remotely operate these things. Well, there are also people out there who would like to remotely operate your grid that you wouldn't like to remotely operate your grid. And so we do have to watch out for that. And so while we as civil engineers and electrical and mechanical engineers can develop these great solutions to grids, or one of my favorites is automated meter reading, we got to look for the, uh, the flip side of that is what can the bad guys do out there or just the, the kid hacking around who really doesn't mean anything other than just wants to see what he can do. But what could, it, what could inadvertently or uh, uh, purposely be done to us and to affect our missions? And so as we look at these smart grids, we do have to be cognizant of that, of how we're tied in to our networks and where that information from that network, while well, maybe it's not the information on the network that's so important, it's where that network is connected to yet another network in the Department of Defense system that we don't want somebody to have access to. Way ahead as we, uh, we continue to look at uh, what opportunities are out there, look at our parameters, uh, try to find a balance between the mission requirements and the technology that's out there, um, and then watch for budgets. We're, there's no way we can island all of our bases, in my opinion. I just don't think we've got that much money. Uh, but nor do we think we really need to. We need to really select the missions that are going to need that, that island. So I jump forward into renewable because the, uh, the smart grids tie in. We can see the various sources of renewables. And the Air Force is either using or exploring all of these sources. The way we've tackled renewable energy is start off with uh, feasibility studies. Actually, I'll say the way we started off was county option. We had uh, developers coming out to individual installations proposing ideas and the Air Force would take a look at those and jump on them. In some cases, they worked out great. They were able to jump on board, take advantage of economic conditions in the particular states and locales, and get some renewable energy projects on board. Our more uh, systematic approach is run uh, this way. Start off with a feasibility study. Go out and look at all of our installations and decide who has the best opportunities for renewable energy. You know, what are their uh, the natural attributes in their area? Southwest, again, photovoltaics makes pretty good sense. Other areas wind, some places waste of energy, and I'll, I'll touch on a couple of slides there. First priority for us with renewable energy is we'd like to develop on-site renewables. Uh, we want to tie in, again, maybe the potential for a grid tie-in, a smart grid tie-in. Uh, we want to pursue uh, these real property uh, renewable energy purchase agreements, again, third-party funding. Uh, also EULs, enhanced use leases. Um, we're, we're relying in the long term on a lot of EULs for our success in the renewable energy because of land that's available, especially again out in the southwestern United States. Uh, we'll look at utility company and third party funded projects, uh, ESPCs, the ESCOs, uh, UESCs, and then finally we'll look at uh, direct Air Force investment on a much more limited nature because again, large scale solar, large scale wind is not something that the Air Force is going to take and deploy when we go to war. We'll take small-scale solar and wind, but the way the Air Force operates is our airmen, our engineering airmen, operate and maintain facilities in peacetime, so when they go to war, they have the skills to operate and maintain those facilities in the wartime. And in fact, in Afghanistan, about 90% of the uh, forward operating bases that were being operated by the Army, the Marines, the Air Force, the engineering component for that for facility operations was coming from the Air Force. Second priority for us with renewables is to procure power from off-site renewable uh, sources. And then third, uh, we'll buy renewable energy credits when we need to. 
um, but that is something that's phasing out in terms of being able to use that in meeting any of those executive order or legislative goals. Right now, we appear to be on track to make our renewable energy goals over the next few years, um, but on track is also dependent upon a lot of third-party financing and third-party ventures coming to, come to fruition. A few examples of some projects that are online for us right now. I won't hit all of those. Nellis at one time I think was the largest solar photovoltaic in the U.S., but for a very short time the industry was moving quickly at that point and surpassed us. And then just a smattering of where we are, these operating locations right now for renewables. And a look ahead, FY10 to 13, where we're, we're working projects now, trying to bring them to fruition. And then a few thermal energy projects that we're working. And you can see a little more scattering there and a little more of a concentration in the southeast there than probably you saw in some of those other categories. We've worked closely with Department of Energy, with the labs, to do our feasibility studies and trying to figure out what's the best bang for the buck, where are we going to see our best payback. And you can see with us, uh, the waste energy arena is looking pretty large there, whether it's uh, straight biomass fuel, uh, biomass waste energy where we're using a mixture of biomass and uh, municipal waste, or the biomass waste to thermal, which may be just strictly municipal waste and only producing a thermal product, not an electrical product. Um, but you can see we're focused now on that biomass, that waste energy. Don't know if it's going to pay off in the end. We find these projects to be very challenging, very difficult right now as we get into the details of each one. Um, but it's a potential uh, opportunity for us. Looking ahead, for those of you who are interested in where we may be going with some, some outreach to industry, uh, opportunity assessments. And again, you'll see some more uh, in the, the south and southeast here. Tyndall Air Force Base, Florida, Pantrick Air Force Base, Florida, Homestead Air Reserve Base, Florida, uh, some of the uh, Cape Canaveral, clearly, some of the ones in the southeast, Keesler Air Force Base, Mississippi, Maxwell, uh, Alabama, looking hard at those locations for opportunity assessments this year. And then just one example, I'm almost to the end here, is we're working specifically a project down at Eglin Air Force Base in the Panhandle at Fort Walton. Um, don't know how this one's going to turn out yet. Woody biomass plant. Uh, from day to day, it's touch and go whether this one's going to pan out economically. Uh, but we're still working this very closely with the, uh, the installation as well as local utility providers um, to see if that's going to work out or if we have to go look for a third party um, to see what's going to play out. Bottom line, the economics every time are really what drive these projects. Sometimes it turns into the environmental as well, but economics would be a big driver. And then just last, I'll leave it with you. Uh, the Air Force is pushing a comprehensive strategy on how we're going to uh, re reduce demand, increase supply, change the culture, uh, centrally managed program, fiscally balanced, trying to make sure we're getting the bang for the buck out there. We're not just uh, throwing dollars away. And uh, as my guys have told me, highly dynamic understates it by about a power of 100. Uh, the situation for our little 50-man energy staff changes by the hour in some cases in a lot of the projects. And again. The financial situations, whether it's state credits, state utility issues, uh, renewable energy credits, uh, uh, you know, for the companies that are involved in the project are huge. And so we'll see how some of this plays out over the next couple of years. But uh, we've got a good way ahead, always looking for ideas. I say that in case any of my folks back at AFCISA are listening. I think they're on the webcast. Um, they're open to your phone calls, but it's that mixed bag of, oh, another phone call from somebody. But... Uh, it pays off for us in the long run. We, we get new ideas, we find new uh, new partners out there, and so we're, we're open to those phone calls and suggestions. And I think that will close me out. So we'll take questions at the end. All right, we'll turn it over to Dr. Holt. Thank you, Colonel. Uh, as I predicted he gave you a rough idea of what the challenges are on the broad spectrum. Uh, now we're going to shift over and look specifically at how a particular base, and I say particular because it's a very unique uh, installation. As you're about to hear, it's, it has some statistics that uh, are really quite compelling. Uh, so I'm going to introduce uh, an individual who can tell you a lot more about that. And that's Dr. Christine Hull, the Chief of Operations and Maintenance Division at Fort Bragg in North Carolina. 
just to give you a rough idea of the magnitude of her challenge, they have 35 million square feet of facilities, 1,500 lane miles of roads, three airfields, all at a time of rapid growth. And she is currently in the process, as you just heard, of recommissioning over 300 facilities and buildings. Uh, it's a major installation, and as a consequence of the recent BRAC activities, it's going to be an even larger installation as time goes on. And it's been on a learning curve over a number of years, and I think you'll get an opportunity to see how a base actually responds to that. Dr. Hall. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure to be here and to represent Fort Bragg and the Director of the Public Works in the U.S. Army Garrison, Fort Bragg. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about um, our energy program on the microphone. Are you saying I'm too short? <laughs> Got it. Is that better? Um, where, where the rubber meets the road. What Colonel Reynolds talked to you about was at a command, a higher command level, and the policies and guidance that are put out at the higher commands. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we've gone through over the past five, ten years at Fort Bragg in adapting and adopting all of the energy policies and guidelines and regulations and getting our world, trying to get our world straight. Um, and again, it is all in a resource constrained environment and it is always with our mind focused on the mission. The mission is always first. Um, we like to think that it's a, what we have put together could be a model for other bases, but at the end of the day, it takes people and there isn't really, what we have found out is there's not one technology that's gonna save us. You know, there is not one foo-foo dust salesman who's going to come give us the magic bullet that will reduce our $50 million energy bill down to something that we can afford. Um, Fort Bragg is very large. Um, it is about 160,000 acres. We have about 53,000 soldiers stationed at Fort Bragg. Um, again, 1,500 lane miles of road you could drive from Florida to Maine and not leave Fort Bragg. Um, it, it's a lot in terms of the infrastructure. And when we say it's more than a city, it really is because if you think of a, a regular city, if you're the mayor of a city or the public works director for a city, you really only own certain pieces of that infrastructure. And you don't own the electric bill or the gas bill for every single building on that piece of property that's called the city. Our garrison commander and our DPW owns everything. He is ultimately responsible for every piece of it. Um, on a daily average, I think our average is about 50 megawatts. We peak at about 120 megawatts per power. Um, we have real-time real pricing. Again, it makes some of our energy projects, and the Army does compete energy projects as well, difficult when we live in the southeast and our energy prices are, are relatively low. I think we pay about six and a half cents per kilowatt hour. Um, peak rates in the summer, of course, um, close to 80 cents an hour. By the end of the BRAC, the last round of base realignment and closing, we assumed Pope Air Force Base, which was contiguous to Fort Bragg. We have undergone a large military construction program over the last 10 years. And by the time everything is done and built out and everybody has moved, 10% of the United States Army will live at Fort Bragg. It is not a small place. Um, one of the big challenges that our energy team has is how to figure out how to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. You know, there are an awful lot of pieces of guidance, policy, legislation, regulations, good ideas, and need to do that come down the pike, either from headquarters or from our own, from our own legislative actions. Um, and our challenge was, how do we fit all of those pieces um, into a concentric puzzle and how do we do it at the same time we're trying to build this whole new machine? At the same time we're doing a billion dollars of military construction. At the same time we are deploying and redeploying soldiers and operating our, our military installation. Um, the approach that the energy team has had has been, the first of all was energy conservation. You know, we don't even begin to talk about renewable energy 
or other forms of energy until we look at energy conservation. How do we reduce our load? Because the size and the amount of renewable energy that we will need can be greatly reduced. So the very first piece of that was energy conservation and then begin to look at the renewable sources. And this is just kind of an idea of the, the things that impact the installation. And we have industry standards, some mandated, some good ideas, mostly things we really need to do. A lot of energy policies and regulations that have changed very rapidly over the past probably five years, six years, um, sometimes faster than our policies and guidance within the, the agency can keep up with. And then we have our installation um, construction team, those folks who are out there trying to build facilities. And if you think, um, remember Colonel Reynolds mentioned MILCON, a project that is thought of today in the military construction world may not be finished for eight years because it goes through a funding cycle and then the design and the construction. Well, the, the things that were coming out of the ground two years ago at Fort Bragg when a lot of the energy policies were coming out had been designed. So that, that, that gel had already set. So we had to look at ways to impact what our A&Es, our architects and engineers were telling us and were providing us without impacting the bottom line because the budget is set for those. We can make some changes in them, but we have to do that within the programmed amount of money. This is the steps at how the energy team looked at solving the energy puzzle. Very elementary, an energy checklist to start with. These were provided to, for construction projects, non-construction projects. We gave them out to all of our A&Es, all of our project managers that specifically talked about the executive orders, the energy acts, how that impacted them and what their responsibilities were to comply with those acts so that they understood very clearly that this, this piece of regulation really and truly did apply to your project. Um, master planning, because we had such a large military construction budget, we have a very robust master planning organization and that has been the key to a lot of successes. Um, and it's determining what we want to do through working groups it's making sure that those master planners who are looking five and 10 and 20 years out are building things into the plans that are smart, that we're, we're starting that early in the process. Um, the energy team provided fact sheets. They developed fact sheets that they could give to architect and engineering firms. And in a lot of our construction was design build. It was not design bid build, but design build. So we were able to provide the A&Es a, a fact sheet that said, here's what's worked at Fort Bragg before. Here's what we're open to trying, and really and truly, honest to goodness, here are the things that we're just not going to go there. For an energy security reason, for an aesthetics reason, whatever, please just don't even offer us this. Here are the things that have worked, and here are the conditions under which they have worked. If you're going to look at a ground source heat pump, here's the sizes that are optimal. Here are the places that it would be beneficial. That saved the A&Es some time and it helped shape the project. It, it made their life easier, and at the end of the day, it makes our life a lot easier. Um, the energy team provided information briefings to A&Es. They also worked with contractors, subcontractors, and brought in technology, brought in folks from research laboratories, from companies to come and talk to our engineers, folks who were afraid to try anything new, to, to be able to come in and say, let us show you, let's do some demonstrations, do it on a small scale, try it on a small scale, because we don't want to fail on a colossal scale. But, but try things out on a small scale so that they have a comfort level and they are open to trying those new things. Um, the checklist with the energy regulations and then the projects. Very actively doing demo projects um, and doing uh, measurement and verification for those projects. And we've partnered with a lot of the schools in North Carolina and with NREL to come in and do uh, small projects. And this is just the series of um, energy acts that our, our energy team put together some information to try to digest this. You know, took the data from other installations. They took the Army regulations, which is our base guidance, um, the, the ASHRAE, the MILCON, everything, digested it into a set of Fort Bragg energy specifications. It became a spec. We have an installation design guide. The design guide tells an A&E firm 
when you build a building on Fort Bragg, when you construct something, here's what we want it to look like, feel like, taste like, smell like. A lot of it was at the higher aesthetic level. If you're in the historic district, you need to conform to these standards. But by providing an energy specification to put in the appendix of it, it provided some very detailed guidance that was much more like a construction spec that the a and &E firms could use. And this is an example of some of the fact sheets. Um, to, again, sounds like it's very elementary, but we wanted to make the life of the guys who are designing the projects a little bit easier so that we got what we wanted. I don't want them to spend a whole lot of money redesigning something or, or reinventing the wheel if we already know what works. We have an energy portfolio, um, and this, is, this has provided us um, the vision for our, our overarching questions. It's part of our overall sustainability program at Fort Bragg. We've had a sustainability program for about 10 years. Um, energy is just one of the goals. This kind of, the portfolio tells us where we want to go, how we want to get there, and how much it's going to cost. Each year with our SRM dollars, our sustainment dollars that are, are appropriated based on the amount of square footage that we have, those dollars are carved up into um, engineering disciplines. There's an architectural piece, a mechanical piece, a civil piece, and there's a senior engineer in all of those fields. The energy piece really is a tiny little piece of that budget, probably a million dollars a year, but it's seed money. And with that money, they have all the projects they'd like to do in the next five years, and we're able to go ahead and push through those that are the most um, likely to be successful and get them through at least the design phase, maybe get the EA done on them, so that when our higher headquarters says, okay, there's a call for projects that we would like to compete for this kind of money, we have something on the shelf. And the energy team can pull it out and say, well, this is ready to go. It's already been cleared by environmental and we have a full design. As a result of that, the energy team was able to use, obtain and use $46 million of other people's money last year. So that million dollar investment grew to $46 million of other people's money. I'll talk just a little bit about our UMCS, our Utility uh, Monitoring and Control System. It's an open lawn network. Um, right now we've got about 300 buildings online with it. Um, it really looks at our HVAC systems. We use it for energy monitoring. We're able to provide mock bills, not real bills, because one of the really hardest pieces of energy conservation that we struggle with is if you live in our building, you don't pay our energy bill. We do. And so it's very difficult to provide that, that reinforcement to the individual's behavior because so much, again, if, if conservation is going to be the most important thing, it relies on the individual who's in one of those 5,000 buildings making the right choices at the right time. Um, so through the UMCS and with the metering, we're able to provide mock bills and compare some like facilities. So a brigade complex, two um, same aged, same sized brigade complexes. It will say, well, you know, the guy across the street here would have been his energy bill last month and here was yours. You know, Commander, you look at, the, look at the numbers and tell us where we can help you do a better job with this. Also with the utility monitoring and control system, we are working to expand it and pull in. We will be merging it this year with our central plants. The energy team has worked with our central plants um, to provide a master plan. We do have an ESPC, an energy savings um, performance contract. It dates back to like 1997. It was a $66 million investment in the Fort Bragg Energy Program and our infrastructure really focused on those big central energy plants that were underloved, under-maintained, and needed some reliable um, operating and maintenance. Uh, we are going through a process now with our ESPC where we are refinancing it. And as a result of the refinancing, uh, we will actually save money over time. So we go from a 7% interest rate that we bought into in 1997 to a 3% interest rate now and are able to do about $11 million more work without increasing our payments over time and extending the life of the contract. And part of that will include a central energy 
plant engineer, somebody who will sit in on the charrettes, on the design plans, anytime that we build buildings that are connected to those plants and help us look at the impacts of that facility on the central system. That sounds very elementary, but it is not something that we had the people or the resources to do prior to this. We had, we had to really change the way we looked at our central energy plants and look at it more as a holistic system and realize that anything we changed downstream of that system impacted the efficiencies and the way that that project um, per performed. Retro commissioning. That is the next big deal. Um, we are looking at 300 buildings this year that we're doing retro commissioning on. These are not our old dog-eared World War II buildings, okay? Fort Bragg has buildings that were built from 1918 till about yesterday. But the ones that we're recommissioning are those that are in the five to 10 years old. There are newer buildings. Think of it as your, your 30,000 mile tune-up. They have some of the newer technologies that are the more difficult to maintain from a precision standpoint and to keep within those operating parameters. Um, and what we have found is we're getting about a 20% energy savings when we can go back out and do retro commissioning. It isn't because our mechanics are not doing what's right. It's because we don't necessarily always have enough people. It's the hanger wire that was holding the, the flue open and we forgot to go back and do it. And in a lot of cases, we are finding that we didn't necessarily design and build it correctly. And we didn't necessarily catch that during the warranty period. Um, so we're seeing a lot of energy savings out of that. And the other piece that the retro commissioning brings back to us is ideas for new projects. Part of that retro commissioning contract is not just go out and evaluate everything and fix it, but come tell us how we can get it to the next level. How do we get that building up to the next level? And again, we, we're in the southeast. It is difficult to make um, a lot of our energy projects pay for themselves. This one pays for itself. Uh, our, our, I, I guess our, our fear is if we can't maintain what we just did, we might lose those energy savings. You know, we struggle. We work really hard to make sure that the mechanics who take care of these buildings on a day-to-day -day basis go out with the contractors who are doing the retro commissioning and we bring back the lessons learned. How do you do it right? And what did you see out there that was wrong that we probably should not be doing again? And again, it's got about a three and a half, a three year payback, 20% annual savings. Our building energy monitor, this is the, the human behavior part. This is the, the um, getting the, everybody out there to believe that it's the right thing to do and even though the money doesn't come out of their pocket or their mission money, that it's the right thing to do. Um, as part of the overall Fort Bragg sustainability program, the cost and the footprint, the overall green footprint of the installation has been very well advertised. Um, but we struggle still with the individual at the building level, who do you hold accountable? Um, for making sure that the lights are out. We have a, a very aggressive program during the peak times when we have to have peak energy prices. Um, saw very good savings last year when we would send out all user emails um, to make sure everybody powered the, the correct things off, the things that were not mission critical, um, and actually saw that the power bill was able to, we were able to save a considerable amount of money. Um, coupled with that, we also installed a, a thermal energy storage last year that creates cold water at night when the prices are low and then we, and saves it in a big beer keg and you use it during the day. It sounds like a very simple technology. We saved $500,000 a month on our electric bill to do that. And that's just at one of the plants. So, you know, the, the out-year ESIP projects will look at more thermal energy storage projects. Um, so when we couple the ability to do the thermal energy storage and the ability to reach out and touch and tell people to please turn things off, we were able to minimize all of our peaks last year. The Green Directorate program is our Green Directorate or Green Boot program is where we go out and we talk to um, individual soldiers at individual buildings. They may be civilians, they may be soldiers. Uh, make sure that they are doing the right things. They're either 
changing the filters when they need to be changed, um, turning off the lights, they understand that what the computer policies are for, for turning those off, and we actually go through a commissioning process with that building with the occupants. So they fully understand what their responsibilities are, and they understand how to do what they, um, what we expect them to do. And, and I, would, I would be remiss if I did not tell you that our, our slogan is the right way, the green way, all the way. In the 82nd Airborne, you understand all the way. Okay. And we do a, a large um, celebration and prop uh, propaganda in, for energy awareness. Um, it was in June of this year. We did one. We will do another one in the fall um, where we have folks out at all of the schools and all of the newspapers making sure that it stays in the forefront of the occupants of the installation, those people who are just occupants of the installation, so they understand the impacts. Even in our family housing, we have privatized family housing. If you've ever lived in, in military family housing, you understand that everything's free. The utilities are free. But in privatized, we actually give them a, a range that they need to stay in with, within their utilities. And if you stay with, below that range, you get a little bit of money back. If you go over that range, you pay a little bit of money. So it, it has incentivized um, where we did not have any incentive before. And these are just some pictures of the folks out at the energy celebration. Very quickly, I will talk to you just very briefly about our attempts at looking at microgrids. This is still, for us, um, a, a lot of unknowns. We know that we that did not necessarily build the technology that we need to start with because microgrids were not necessarily known at that time. We have a, a lot of generators on the installation that are about every variety that you could possibly imagine having. We did not install them with the idea of ever being able to, to look at a microgrid. Um, so we are working with Searle and with CTC and with NREL to look at ideas where we can microgrid at least small sections of the installation. Um, and for energy security and for um, net zero, we are not one of the installations that is, the Army has designated to be net zero, but we will be net zero. Um, we just will. And, and that means that you will use no more energy than you produce. And it will be for energy, for waste will be net zero for waste, and for water. And those are three goals that Fort Bragg has had for about 10 years. And you're giving me the, yeah, I'm in a hurry. And, I, and the last slide is just bringing the parts of the puzzle together. You know, it took staff, it took funding. We had an, a golden opportunity with Milcon and with those projects that, that had we had to go back and retrofit or start from the very beginning because that supplemental funding really gave us the boost to do it, um, we were able to, to bring those pieces together. And I'll stop. Thank you. I think you can see, as promised, uh, the Bragg story gives you a real indication of what does it take to accomplish it, and it's all of the vectors. It's not just any single vector that will get you where you're headed in that particular case. Our last speaker has a somewhat different background than the first two in this particular case. Dr. Stephen Meyer is Vice President for New Business Initiative at Lockheed Martin Corporation today, but he's got about 20 years of experience with federal and private industry. Uh, in that time, he's been with NASA, he's been with Lockheed Martin and SAIC. He holds a BS in physics from George Mason, an MS in physics from uh, University of Southern California, MS in electrical engineering, and a PhD in electrical engineering. Um, and he's with Lockheed Martin today. He'll give us a little different perspective. Thank you, Steve. Right. Thank you. Good afternoon. I want to thank Georgia Tech for having me uh, down here this afternoon. That's uh, privilege to speak and be on this esteemed panel. So let me first uh, start off, I guess, with the, uh, yeah, okay. Open it up here. Okay, I think we're good to go here. All right. So the first thing I want to start out with is uh, why are we 
you know, Lockheed Martin and why is Lockheed Martin involved in energy? Everyone thinks of Lockheed Martin as building airplanes, spacecraft, rockets, ships. So, um, you know, w what's the play here with Lockheed Martin? Why do they care? Actually, Lockheed Martin, we have a very large portfolio in, um, we call it adjacent markets within energy. And I'll show you why in a little bit. But essentially, we are one of the premier, if not the premier systems integrator for the Department of Defense. That's integrating very complex end-to-end -end systems. So there's a lot of parallels with what we do with ships and airplanes and very complex systems with the energy. So, you know, with an energy environment, you understand there's energy sources, there's transmission, distribution, delivery. Those are all the things. We're also, you know, providing the energy with powers all these different vehicles, which are airplanes and ships and, and uh, satellites. So there's a very easy common overlap between those two. This is a very large adjacent market in Lockheed Martin that we believe is going to continue to grow. So uh, we have a vested interest in it. We're committed to it. We've been involved in energy since 2008, since we've had several energy initiatives. It's one of the uh, core areas within our, uh, our organization. We're going to continue to grow in it. All right. So on the next slide, uh, I'll uh, just talk to you a little bit. I'm going to start out with a little background on Lockheed Martin to show you what we're doing and how we're here to serve our customers. So Lockheed Martin right now has about 123,000 employees, 63,000 scientists and engineers, and we have uh, operations and facilities in a variety of places you can see. You can drive around town here or many other places and see Lockheed Martin on the top of a building. Uh, the other thing of note is that we employ approximately 5% of all graduating engineers, undergraduates. So that's about 4,000 engineers annually per year that are employed by Lockheed Martin. So we, we really uh, you know, grab the best and the brightest out of universities such as Georgia Tech and many others. Uh, I want to continue to grow in that area. So here's what the company looks like right now. So again, set the tone. That's a little on statistics. We have four business areas, as you can tell. We have aeronautics, which produces airplanes, F-22, F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, C-5, C-130. There's a whole variety of airplanes within the aeronautics division. Electronic system, that works with littoral combat ship, missile and warning systems, very broad, diverse business area. IS and GS, information systems, global solutions, that is an area which does a lot of complex systems engineering, ground stations, IT architectures, uh, they're the ones that kind of integrate all the cyber aspects, you know, and all of our systems together. And then finally, space systems. In space systems, we do a variety of satellites, rockets, we work with ULA. So that's kind of the thrust of, um, of the uh, company within space systems. And I'm part of corporate engineering and technology. So I'm actually out of Bethesda, Maryland, out of headquarters. And my job is to serve as an enabler, as a horizontal integrator across all the business areas. So within my portfolio, I have energy, I have advanced materials, I have critical infrastructure, I also have nanotechnology. So I'm the guy who's not, say, directly working on, you know, the ships, the planes, and the airplanes, but working across the variety. So I have internal research and development dollars, which I fund a lot of energy activities within each of these areas. So on the next slide, here are just some of the examples of uh, what we're involved in here. As you can clearly see, you know, there's a variety of topics. I mean, just looking within IS and GS, utility services, efficiency, smart integration, demand response, energy savings, whole slew of activities within energy there. Electronic systems, we're doing a lot of renewables, biomass, biofuels, oceans, thermal, variety there, intelligent micro grid, fuel cell, small nuclear reactors, uh, all of those. And then uh, within space systems, carbon monitoring, wind prediction we've gotten into where we have these, uh, we have a system called LIDAR, light imaging, laser imaging detection and ranging, and ranging which can then show ramp ups and ramp downs for wind farms essentially and predict it 30 to 60 minutes before the wind hits to get optimal efficiency. We produce the GOZAR satellite, advanced fuel cells, battery technologies for satellite systems. And then finally within aeronautics, all types of manufacturing efficiencies, uh, materials research, energy harvesting, biofuels R&D. 
So as you can tell, this is a big portfolio working across the whole wide variety of projects to meet our customers' needs. Our main customer is the DOD. I mean, there's no question we have over 80% of our business is within the Department of Defense. We're also working closely with them to meet a lot of the new mandates coming out. The Navy's Go Green by uh, 2015, Air Force 50-50 blend of alternative fuels by 2016. So working closely with them to, uh, to uh, focus on some of those activities. And then this is just another picture in a format where it kind of shows a lot of things are integrated in the cybersecurity circle here in the middle. That kind of weaves everything together because we're experts at command and control. Ultimately, you're setting up these energy systems. They need, you know, some optimization, the command and control. It's everything that's going to be involved with sustainability, microgrids, alternative generation. Uh, for example, on nuclear power plants, we have a partnership with GE Hitachi. They build the power plant for a nuclear one. We do all the command and control. So we're experts in those areas. And on the next slide, ourselves, we are actually committed to energy savings ourselves within our own company. Again, starting back a few years ago, I mean, we have several, like uh, this Owego uh, biomass facility up in New York, where we're using wood chips and other things, and this facility powers the entire campus up there. Uh, we rank seventh out of, uh, in Fortune 500 countries for companies for green energy purchases, saved over 275 million kilowatts uh, annually from 2007 to 10, 15% reduction in carbon emissions, waste of landfill, water usage, and we scored an A for carbon performance on uh, carbon disclosure practices. So we're one company where we practice what we preach. We, we are implementing energy efficiency policies and management across all of our facilities. I mean, I have pages here where you could tell, give me a city and I can tell you what's going on in there in terms of saving money or saving uh, energy. So uh, if, if you're interested in what's going on in Atlanta, what's going on in Philadelphia, what's going on in Fort Worth, we have a whole slew of things where we're trying to conserve water, building energy, make things more energy efficient. So again, this is a little more example where these are just some pictures of the Owego biomass facility. This is down in Orlando where we've implemented solar, solar lighting, LEDs for all of our electricity. Uh, this just shows the Akron, Ohio, where they've done certain uh, building construction and saved over like 30 or 40 percent energy efficiencies. So um, we're working across all of them to really reduce our, our carbon footprint, reduce emissions, and save energy. Uh, the closest one around here, you all are familiar with uh, most likely the Martin Marietta facility. Uh, this just shows pictures of the F-22, the C-130, and the C-5. I mean, across there, it, it is just a huge amount of things. There's so, so many numerous that I had to just even print it out on a piece of paper. I mean, in 2011, site reduction goals include reducing carbon emissions by 1%, reducing landfill waste by 2.5%, water consumption by 6.5%. Uh, recently, an F-22 Raptor flew using a 50-50 blend of conventional petroleum and biofuels derived from Camilla. So we're and putting together a reverse osmosis system that's fully implemented, saving more than 200,000 gallons of water per day. So new lighting fixtures will use 40% less energy. So again, we're working to put all this into practice you know, within all of our facilities and which also that the military can leverage in a lot of their bases, smart grids, microgrids, and forward operating bases. So right now, just to summarize things up, it's kind of short and sweet. We're working, you know, actively engaged in solving, you know, the 21st century energy challenges. Uh, we're here today, and uh, I'd be open to answering questions, thoughts, or ideas. We've worked with several different uh, Army installations, such as Fort Bliss on energy management, uh, there's been a few other ones that we've um, also worked with, CERDEC, and uh, help them manage their energy practices. So we've been actively working across many military installations to help them improve. We're also one of one out of 16 federal energy management contractors that has uh, been accepted by the uh, Department of Energy to help reduce footprints and, and maintain energy efficiency within federal buildings. So uh, a lot of these practices we're putting in play moving forward with them and uh, are here to help uh, solve your energy problems. So that's about it. Okay.
we've got some microphones out there for uh, those who might want to answer a question in this particular guy. Um, my name is Ram Shetty. Uh, this uh, question is for Colonel Reynolds. So it uh, seems like you have you are managing uh, multiple um, managing multiple bases. So I'm curious to see if you kind of a benchmark you know, against uh, multiple bases to see which one is performing better compared to something else. You know, so that you can identify if there are best practices. Do, do something like that? We do something like that. Uh, Department of Energy and uh, Office of Secretary of Defense actually have tracking systems. We have an annual reporting system uh, back up to the, to the Pentagon uh, to indicate how we're doing across the board with energy use. And we are able to some extent take a look at the different bases and see their energy uh, use. We're not trying to make every base meet all the same goals, but we do want to see who's who's doing better and, and then what lessons we can learn. My name is uh, Jules Trya. I work um, for the city of Atlanta here, um, specifically in electric vehicle readiness. And I was just wondering, uh, I know there's a lot of goals out there for how we can uh, integrate renewable energy into the Department of Defense. Um, so I was just wondering, what role do you guys see plug-in electric vehicles playing uh, in the future uh, for the Department of Defense specifically? Maybe potentially for energy storage for some of these renewables, or what do you think? For the hybrid electric? Any kind of any kind of a uh, plug-in electric that could store we're energy. we use some on the installation now mm -hmm. um, within because our installation is large enough that we can maintain that infrastructure within it um, for most of these the rate limiting step has always been the refueling capability or the infrastructure um, but we do have hybrid electric um, vehicles available as part of our GSA fleet. You know, we all use mm -hmm. GSA vehicles and they require us to use alternative fuel vehicles and some hybrid electrics. Yeah, from the facility energy side of the house, we're, we're not as focused on uh, electric vehicles. Um, our, when I talked about the pie earlier and the aviation being a large chunk and facilities a piece, Outside of my portfolio on the vehicle side of the house, they are looking at uh, the different vehicle types. And as Dr. Hull mentioned, the alternative fuel vehicles are, are heavily in use across the DOD now. Uh, electric vehicle use is growing. That's, that's good to hear. Here's a question from one of our webcast participants to uh, Colonel Reynolds. Um, uh, how do you participate in or advocate for major demand reduction initiatives that require the coordination of other uh, Air Force functional directors. For instance, converting from thousands of desktops and laptops to a thin client central computing solution increases computer security while simultaneously reducing electrical demand and HVA, HVAC offset to cool as a result of the CPU. Somebody out there has thought about that question a lot. And uh, <laughs> how do we do it? I'll be honest, not that well. Uh, not that well. We are uh, really just now into a partnership with our uh, our computer. We call the A6 community within the Air Force, but that's the uh, the computing, the information management folks. They've done a lot with just the the developing technology that's out there for for computers, with the ability to put the computers to sleep at night, those kind of things, um, to save energy. But as far as getting into our our our, our central nodes for computing. That's still in its infancy with us right now. And actually, it's a, a new partnership. We're working with the, the communications community in the Air Force. I, I think it's a really good example of where energy is everybody's business. I mean, it's not something we have partnered with or we've begun to talk about it. But again, it's not something we would do from a public works perspective as the building owners. But it is, and our, our information folks don't pay the electric bill. So they don't have the vested interest to do that. So we have to help them understand there's, there may be some other good reasons to do it. My name's Mark Miller. Um, and my question is, what kind of agreements have you entered into with third parties or the private sector to further your um, provisions of sustainable energies? 
typically they've involved some type of a real estate deal. There's enhanced use leasing, where we're leasing out property to a third party, and then these uh, PPAs, as we call them, uh, purchase power agreements. In both cases, there's real estate involved. Uh, and they're, they're definitely more of a financial real estate deal than they are an engineering uh, project. Uh, and that really is where the challenge comes in. The, the, the energy technology is there. It's how can we bring this project together with the, uh, the state, uh, the local utilities, or if the local utility is not going to be a part of it, the third party, and then what incentives are out there for that third party within that state or community to, to make these deals work. Hi. Hello, is this working? Thank you. Um, I'm Liz York from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And um, we seem to, which is a federal, um, federal department, uh, in case people didn't know, um, and we seem to uh, often run into this um, uh, dance between um, using an ESPC or a third party um, agreement and um, being able to fund it with um, repair and improvement dollars and, you know, just kind of hard fund it. And I know that, you know, people, some people are more conservative and some people are um, uh, okay with risk and getting others involved and um, that sort of thing. I guess my question to you would be, um, when you are facing resistance or, or if you've ever faced resistance in people understanding what UESCs and ESPCs do and what the benefits are, what are some ways that you can help them um, understand these vehicles and um, move into accepting them and, and trying them out? Just any experience you have in, in that kind of um, arena. From, from our ESPC standpoint, we, we were well into it when I came to Bragg. Um, but I think anybody who would look at it from our higher headquarters would see the $66 million investment that they made in our infrastructure that would have never been a Milcon project. I mean, utilities simply aren't sexy. That, that does not, it, it doesn't compete well against a gym or a, a company operations facility or a barracks when it comes to, to Milcon. This allowed us to put money into the installation, into our infrastructure that we would not have had before. We have the same challenges probably everybody else does with the measurement and the verification of making sure that we truly are getting our energy savings out of it. One of the challenges that we have now, and we see a lot of ESPC um, being pushed, you know, try these, we need to use them. From our standpoint, the money that we would spend on an ESPC or a UESC comes out of our base operations money. It doesn't come out of our repair and maintenance, and base operations is where we are the shortest. And so it's very difficult to spend money today that, you, that we're, we're very tight on with the promise of, return on investment in four or five years because our budget cycles aren't don't lend themselves well to that type of management and i know people who've had great success with the spcs and people who will tell you eh. and you hit on a very current friction point right now there are increased go there's goals out there to increase use of the espcs and the air force has had uh, mixed luck uh, we went through a period a few years ago where we opened up uh, the floodgates to ESPC projects and the uh, Air Force auditors and DOD auditors came in and reviewed the results and weren't real happy with the um, lack of measurement and verification and the lack of, out, you know, lack of basically final product that we were getting. Um, as a former commander in Omaha, Nebraska, I loved UESCs and ESPCs. I got some great new upgrades to my infrastructure that I couldn't get through the normal Milcon process and O&M process, but I had a very small, narrow view as that installation engineer. I was happy to get new equipment that made my mechanics life better. I wasn't too worried about the 30-year bill that came or a 25-year bill that came along with it. Now as I sit at a higher level in the corporation, if you will, a little bit more of a look at that 25-year deal, and I want to make sure those are good deals because, again, it's like renewable energy. These are financial deals with a little bit of construction on the end. There is definitely some good, uh, good, uh, goodness that can come out of these ESPCs and UESCs if the deals are structured well and we put the right things into them for the payback. So we're going to use them a, a lot more, I'm sure. Um, my question has to do with um, I'm Mary Hallisey Hunt. I work for Georgia Tech. Um, it has to do with the same question. You know, everybody's looking 
for funding, you know, third parties to help or other parties to help um, um, in research and development right now. Um, what is the military stance or the basis stance or whatnot? You, you've gotten funding or you've worked with NREL, or you've worked with other universities. We're going towards this whole, you know, collaborative effort, at least at the federal level. They want industry, they want academia, they want government partnered. What is DOD or your particular base or, or what is their stance or policy on how they're going to engage or how you engage in these, you know, collaborative efforts that require sharing of information? Um, you hit on another challenge. Uh, um, <laughs> For renewable energy, for instance, we were trying to figure out how do we get third parties involved. We don't necessarily want unsolicited proposals because that comes with a whole other rule, set of rules and regulations with the acquisition community that uh, can turn out to take the person who proposes that deal and, and throw them out of the deal after they've gone through a lot of time, effort, and money. Um, so how do we reach out to the community? For renewable energy, for the Air Force, we went out with a series of outreach days held meetings in Dallas, Texas, and then held the next meeting out in uh, Tucson, Arizona, looking for financiers, engineering companies, developers who are interested in renewable energy collaboration, not to bring us their specific project for a specific location at that time, but to bring us what capabilities they had and, and give us information on what they thought was really viable within industry, finance, in particular states, so that we could begin to go develop specific projects. Um, it is a, a, a fine line on that collaboration of how far we can go within the acquisition regulations we have. Uh, you were mentioning some test projects. We struggle with that when we have a contractor that wants to come bring us a new product and just show us a test of that product, but they want to install it on our facility for an extended period of time. Now we're starting to get into a, a, a gray area of whether we can accept that or not. In terms of sharing, we also work with CERL, the Corps of Engineers Research Laboratory, where they have most of our construction research. And um, it's a DOD grant process, the ESTCP. And after we get to a certain point in sharing, and those, those organizations usually bring in academics to us, as opposed to us reaching out and finding them. Um, and then there's a process that we go through beyond which we have to have security clearances. I mean, because there really are some things that, that we're not going to necessarily provide for an unsolicited proposal or somebody who walks in off of the street. Um, but, but they've been very successful. Are, have there been any examples you, that come to mind where you've been part of a, a group, you know, what, say Lockheed Martin, a university and a base or, you know, or a, uh, the, the fire station that we just built at Linden Oaks, one of our um, remote family housing areas, it's, it's part of the contiguous installation, but you have to go off to come back on. Um, we did an, it was an ESTCP project, and the, the grant went to, and it was through Searle, and I honestly cannot remember the university, but with several companies and with South Face to make it a, a lead silver, lead platinum facility. Thank you. I'm David Dunnigan with the Georgia Department of Economic Development, but formerly with the Department of Energy. And I was just curious uh, to what extent the DOE's Federal Energy Management Program, FEMP, comes into play. What's their role? Yeah, we do have a relationship with FEMP, uh, starting with uh, annual awards. We submit through DOE FEMP uh, program for annual awards. There's also data reporting that goes up into DOE, the Energy Star system that was mentioned earlier in the briefings. Uh, we're tied in with that DOE Energy Star program. But are they helping with your assessments? Uh, we've hired DOE to help us in, in some cases, uh, and we do some work with some of their laboratories. Again, typically a, a pay for for use. I guess my question question would be primarily for Dr. Hull. Sounds like you've got some pretty challenging energy, not only currently but in the future, right. for power. And I'm just curious. How much focus is being uh, placed on solar? A general, do you have a general idea, a percentage idea of how much? I, I couldn't give you the percentage. I can okay. tell you we've installed solar on several of our new facilities, okay. and we are looking at a, a five-acre um, solar facility as a PPA. Um, again, we, we go very slowly into those because it really is a real estate transaction. 
Um, and, and that is the type of thing that we need a larger quantity um, to make successful. Sure. Where the Air Force has lots of excess land out west, we have <laughs> we are constrained. We are encouraged. <laughs> <laughs> Fort Bragg is constrained. We are, we are very um, sure. constrained in, in where we can grow, and Mission has the, the biggest footprint. Um, so anything that we would take out of either a, an industrial use or use within our containment or out of the Mission footprint, we need to think long and hard about tying that up and making sure that the return on investment is right. solid. But yes, our new Warrior in Transition Battalion has solar panels all along the top of it. Yeah, I was curious, how would a private company go about getting involved, say, as a vendor with Fort Bragg? Our company provides foundation posts for the solar ground mount projects. It, Is in, there a certain In most of ours, or? again, we have worked them through the Milcon projects. Okay. So it is part of a project that's already out there that's, that may be being designed, it may be in the construction phase, okay. but they're, they're generally through the Savannah District or the Wilmington District Corps of Engineers is the executing agency for our military construction. Okay. Thank you. We, we found that much more effective than just a wholesale, we're going to do solar. Hi, I'm Keith Adams with Deloitte. I have a qu another question about Keith Fort Bragg, it. very popular. Um, <clears throat> I, I believe I understand that Fort Bragg, uh, that a number of the sort of infrastructure pieces at Fort Bragg are privatized, electric distribution, yes. water, wastewater. Water, wastewater. I, I'd be curious to, to find out if you've done analysis at this point to determine if that has indeed saved money at Fort Bragg. And I'd also like to see if you can comment on its impact on uh, on, uh, on installation security at the base. If it has saved maintenance and repair and operation dollars? So uh, above? No, because we fund the contract right. at, the, at what it should cost, where we never put the, the Army never had the ability to pay that when it was an in-house operation. So at so the end of the day, reliability. it's improved reliability, but you can't compare the two together. It's apples and oranges because we now have a, we have a better system because we've invested more in that system. And, and we do look at the reliability and the energy security. Um, that, that's something we pay an awful lot of attention to. From the electrical standpoint, we put in extra transmission lines coming into the installation this year so that we have three separate transmission lines. Um, and from our water and wastewater, you know, we are no longer the owner operator of an on post um, water and wastewater plant. And so like many other facilities, we've had to look at our security pieces differently for that. And, and other than reliability, is there any other sort of national defense security issues that have, um, that have arisen or been analyzed as a result of these privatizations? We go through vulnerability assessments every year on all of those. I have a question about uh, wind and solar and the use of storage. Uh, what is the view today of uh, whether it's Air Force or Army about deploying storage with solar? I know up until now it really hasn't been done. That would be my analysis is it's not good enough yet. You know, we're definitely looking for those uh, solutions that will definitely work for us for uh, wind and solar. When you say it's not good enough, are you saying the battery technology? Exactly. Battery technology, just, just not good enough storage for us right now for large scale in some areas. Yeah, for large scale, but for distributed energy, it's been proven in commercial applications that it is good enough. So just depending on, you're talking 2 megawatts or, or 100 kilowatts, you know, just... It all depends. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it seems that like you're only interested in uh, particular the base in uh, installation. What about what about green energy experimental site that partner with academics and industry? Um, yeah, we we have some wind uh, projects out scattered around the world, actually. Um, not large scale, where we're still developing some other projects. Uh, it's a growing area for us, actually. But uh, I don't see that it's going to be the answer for, for wide scale application for us. Uh, Air Force is very interested across the United States when uh, large wind farms are going up off of Air Force property 
Uh, we're always watching for encroachment issues with flying uh, training routes uh, and also looking at uh, radar impacts, as I mentioned earlier, with wind energy. Neither are showstoppers. They're things that just have to be considered when projects are being developed. Sam Shelton here at Georgia Tech. Uh, th this has been a great discussion on the complexities of uh, implementing all our new energy technologies that we like to talk about. But it's uh, implementing them is uh, much more complex than some of us technologists like to think. Uh, question, your cost accounting. Uh, what what uh, accounting measures do you use for your cost measures? Is it simple payback? Is it uh, life cycle cost? Is it levelized cost? What, what, what audit? We're using life cycle cost models, and some of it goes back to the Department of Energy uh, modeling, and then uh, some simple uh, saving to investment ratios. So uh, another sort of non-technical question on the sort of money side. Has there been any kind of conversation of speeding up the process? You said, you know, from inception to final product, eight years, especially in an area where renewable energy is changing, the technology is changing so rapidly, and the companies are pretty new, and for them to be able to invest in something that, who knows, to be honest, a lot of the companies might not be around in eight years that are going to think they're doing some of their noble projects. That doesn't make us feel better. <laughs> I'm not saying, uh, some of it's going to be because some new technology comes out and it gets better. So some of the times it's not for anything bad. I mean, to use Solyndra as the example, it's because silicone prices fell. I mean, so eight years is a long time in this space that's changing so quickly. Has there been any sort of conversation as part of improving the cost and improving your own adaptation to change that for renewables. Uh, I'll take that, absolutely. And Dr. Ho was refer referring to eight years on a, a Milcon project, maybe from initial concept programming all the way through execution. Uh, our, our third party funded projects, our uh, ESCO type projects, probably about two years, and even that's too long. Um, we, we recognize that, we've had discussions, what, what drags that out? And again, some of it's the economics, some of it's the uh, environmental factors. Uh, you go to put a uh, solar field in Arizona on a base that you think is underutilized properly and find uh, the world's largest collection of uh, Native American artifacts uh, as you start to break ground. And there goes part of your planning. And so you need to do more due diligence up front in that uh, arena, but it comes with a time-consuming uh, portion that drags out that timeline. So still looking for how much risk you can take in the development of the project versus the execution. But, it, but it's definitely a subject that's on the table all the way to the outer rings of the Pentagon of how do we do this faster, because we need to do it faster. Well, now we come to the final Jeopardy part of the uh, program today. And so the, the final question in this case is, uh, particularly here in the southeast, the cost of electric power, which is a big part of the total energy bill, is low. You've been blessed by having military construction projects that uh, can incorporate new technologies. From what you've learned, what would you say to a facility engineer who doesn't have a Milcon project and is looking for a way to do integration of clean energy into a base here in the southeast? You live in that uh, the first is, is retro commissioning. Um, retro commissioning and making sure that the lessons learned are retained. That, that there's an AAR after that, and and you institutionalize what you learned, um, so that we don't repeat those, we don't repeat the sins of the past, and we take care of the infrastructure that we have. Yeah, uh, I would probably agree with a lot of those sentiments. I mean, you know, a lot of the questions have been directed more. I mean, we're we're a system provider. I mean, we're going to provide solutions here. We're not making the mandates. So uh, a, a lot of the uh, discussion, I'd say, you know, would, uh, I would agree with uh, Dr. Hall in terms of her assessment of those things. Uh, I mean, we are here to provide those services in terms of the retrofitting and keeping existing structures uh, moving forward. We have, you know, we work with Fort Bliss, Hill Air Force Base, we work with several to produce different energy management techniques. And uh, as you see from some of the slides, we work across all these different areas. So we'd be willing to provide any of those types of services to help, you know, save energy. Well, looking at the clock, our time is up. So join with me and thank you to our panel. Yeah. <laughs>